Oh, that's right, huh? Yeah, but coming in now. Okay. Okay, welcome. Thank you. I think we will get going a little bit late, but we're here. Welcome, everybody. I'd like to call this meeting to order, and we will start with our Pledge of Allegiance, please. All together now. Here we go. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag. flag. Of, of the United, United States, States of America, America. and to the and Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible with, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. For all. Who? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mitch, if you'll do a roll call, please. Good evening, President Swartz. Here. Vice President Neuris. Here. Trustee Goodman. Here. Trustee Holliber. Here. Trustee Mandelkern. Here. Student Trustee Chenette. Here. Madam President, also in attendance are Chancellor Clare, Kenyatta College President Moore, Stan Lane College President Marino, College of San Mateo Interim President Lopez, Chief Financial Officer Slater and District Academic Senate President Wallace. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Vice Chancellor Bailey. Uh, it has come to my attention that the staff would like to recommend that this board adjourn this meeting in the memory of Dr. Gina Rhodes, a counselor and director of Disability Resource Center at Kenyatta College. She passed away last week after a long illness. Uh, the consensus of the board, we will adjourn this meeting in her honor. Thank you. Yes. Somebody needs to mute themselves or something. Okay, we're going to the discussion of the order of the agenda. Are there any board members who would like to make any corrections and edits to the agenda? Where are you all three, four? Seeing none, I will go down to announcement of reportable actions taken in closed session. There are none to report. Statements from the public are non agenda items. I will ask if, if there are any statements reminding you from the public that you have a three minute or a 20 minute total time to talk. If you are interested in saying something on non agenda items, you may participate by raising your using the raise hand function at the bottom right of the screen. And then I will call on you to speak. I do not see any hands raised for speaking on non-agenda items. So I will move to new business. 20-101A, the approval of personnel items, changes in assignment, compensation, placement, leaves, staff allocations, and classification move of activities. Approval. We have a motion, I need a second. Second. Thank you very much. If there's any questions, we have Director David Fune here. Are there any public comments? Any comments or corrections or clarifications from board members? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes with unanimous vote. Uh, Madam President. Yes. If I could just make one quick present is, uh, comment. You know, we often see retirees with, you know, 20 to 30 years of service to this district. I think it's unusual that we see um, someone retiring with 38 years of service. So I just wanted to commend Chuck Lamar on his retirement. I don't know if he's with us tonight or not, oh, but yeah. you know, he's been literally a fixture uh, at many of our meetings in person and helping with our, all of our uh, IT and audiovisual services over the years and uh, much appreciate his commitment to the district. 
Well said. I totally agree. I have looked out for many, many meetings and saw Chuck sitting, sitting out there. So he uh, happily enjoy his retirement. It's well earned. I'll let Chuck know for sure, Dr. President. Thank you, Thank you David. Okay, moving down to the consent agenda, items 20-101CA and 20-2CA. We'll take those together if the board approves. The first one, 20-101CA is adoption of resolution number 20-13, which is in support of the state proposition 15. The next one is 20-2CA, adoption of resolution number 20-14 and 20-15, in support of the San Mateo County School District bond measures. So moved. Thank you. Second? Second. Very good. Uh, let's see. We're good. No objection to taking these together. Any comments or, uh, from board members? Or consent agenda item. Oh, consent agenda. Yeah. So, it's ready to vote. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Other recommendations, 20-10-101B, adoption of statement of appreciation and support of district employees for exemplary efforts during COVID-19 pandemic. At our meeting on September 23rd, the board ratified the chancellor's recommendation to hold all classes, services, and operations with limited exceptions online or remotely for the spring of 2021. At that time, the board expressed interest in making a statement of appreciation and support to district faculty, staff, and administration for their exemplary efforts during COVID-19 pandemic. This draft statement as a board report is presented for the board's consideration. I would like to have a motion and a second for a discussion. So moved. Thank you, and a second, please. Second. Very good. Are there any comments or edits from the board on the proposed draft? One, two, three. Hearing none. Are there any public comments on the proposed draft? We'll call for the vote. Vote. All in favor, aye. 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 Thank you. We have uh, the motion has carried by unanimous vote. 20-10102B, adoption of resolution number 20-16, recognizing undocumented student action week. So moved. Thank you. Uh, are there any public comments? Dr. Marino can move aside and show us her beautiful background. So she's, uh, somebody made that for her and, and recommend for the undocumented week. It's beautiful. Thank you. Are there any board discussion, comments, or uh, comments or questions? Hearing none, call for the vote. All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes by unanimous vote. We are now at our study session. 20-10-1C, District Strategic Plan Annual Update and Review. Chancellor Claire will introduce the topic and Vice Chancellor Aaron McVean will make the presentation. Thank you, so, thank you so much, President Schwartz. And um, I, I um, am really excited about introducing this topic. You know, I, I've talked a lot um, both internally and, ex and, and really in public about our need to be disciplined in everything we do. And I can think of nothing um, more disciplined than developing a strategic plan developing measurable metrics, and then executing that plan. And that's, for me, that's a key focus of, of the work we do together, both at the board chancellor level and at the um, institution level. And I really wanna appreciate the, the leadership of Dr. McBean, the, the folks that have served on the, um, the committee and, and in terms of updating this plan. And in particular, I'd like to thank Trustee Mandelkern and Trustee Nurse as being our board representatives. Uh, we appreciate your input as this plan was being developed. I really wanna turn it over to Dr. McBean and I look forward to hearing the presentation. Thank you, Dr. McBean. Uh, thank you, Chancellor Clare, um, President Soares, members of the Board of Trustees, 
presidents, faculty and staff colleagues, and community members who are joining us this evening. Um, it is my pleasure, as it always is, to bring you a performance in three acts this evening um, on an update for the district strategic plan. So if I can go ahead and share my screen. Um, the first act will focus on a uh, review of our district strategic plan metrics and a look at how we performed um, over the, uh, since we did an update for you last year. Um, and then we will move on to a discussion of the strategic plan update process. And if you can still hear me, my Zoom seems to be having issues right now. Of course it is. Apologies to everyone. I was telling you that we could hear you and see your first page, but I was muted, so that didn't be really good. Oh, uh, you know, nothing like a little technology. So Zoom decided to crash. We'll try this one more time from the top. Assuming everybody can hear and see now. Thank you, Kim. Yes. All right. As I think I was saying, um, the second act will really be to talk about the district strategic plan update process. I want to be able to share a little bit of the uh, environmental scanning data that the committee um, looked at and then uh, do uh, basically a first review of the revised goals and district-wide strategies for our next strategic plan. Um, this, uh, as, as folks may know, this was not a, a complete uh, redo or brand new strategic plan. Our focus in that process really is to revise and update. And so that'll be part of the discussion when we get to act two. And then the interesting part of the evening, the act three really um, that folks have requested, we have a, a number of guests for our Promise Scholars program here, um, including some student speakers tonight. So I'll try to move through uh, efficiently in the first two, um, but as always, this is the board study session. So please do feel free to ask questions along the way. And President Swartz, if you can keep me honest and let me know if the board has any questions as we go. I can't see everybody. On the screen. Do my best. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So our district strategic plan does focus and will continue to focus on student success, equity, and social justice. And as I like to do, I like to start out with some numbers just to give us a little warm up. So this number, 20,461, was the number of students enrolled in the district last fall at census, fall 2019. And of those students, 35% of them were full time. So about a, just over a third of students were full-time. This number represents the number of first-time students who joined us that fall, first-time in college students. And of that number, almost 70%, 68% started out full-time. Um, and we review this uh, every year. The majority of our first-time students, those who come to college for the first time, do start out with us as full-time students. And so, as we go through this and you hear the focus on how they're doing in the first set of metrics, it's because most of the first time students do start out of that full time category. And for fall 2019, that was just over 2,200 first time full time students. Um, it's appropriate at this point, too, because we are coming to the end of this five year strategic plan to look at how our progress has been over the past five years based on our metrics. And you see there we started in fall 2015 at just uh, under 1900 and just 1888 first time full time students. And so a lot of our efforts have been to really try to increase that that full time enrollment of the first time in college students and we've we have increased uh, just over 18% over the last five years. So making good progress because we know that all other completion metrics tend to favor those students who can be full time. Some things that we couldn't have predicted that have definitely impacted the metrics of our strategic plan over the past five years, a, a huge one being AB 705. When we started out in fall 2015, looking at students starting in basic skills, math and English, that is starting below transfer level. Um, you see there we had some significant percent and we were making progress as a district 
And then AB 705 legislation from the state came and basically mandated that students should be placed in transfer level. And so you see as of fall 2019, I think we've exceeded our goals, um, but it, the mandate itself is, isn't enough. Um, really a, a credit and recognition to all of our faculty who worked tirelessly to address that mandate from the state. Um, and developed new curriculum specifically in math with co-requisite courses at the transfer level, um, but as well as expanding our, our availability of English 105 and direct placement. Um, so most of our first time full time students, almost every single one, if they enroll in their first year, they are starting now in transfer level math and English. And so that's what our next two metrics are. And so as we move forward, in our next revision of the strategic plan, these are some of the metrics that we'll look to adjust and revise because most of our students will be starting in transfer level math and English. And our, our, our attention has turned to what is their success and completion in that first year in those areas, given all the changes we've seen in the curriculum. Uh, but it's great progress. And as we move to our completion metrics, the impact of this change will really be felt um, beginning this graduating year because um, we're two years out from that significant curriculum change um, based on AB705. And then we look at our completion metrics. Um, one of our, our, our big focuses is to look at completion of a degree within 150% of normal time or in basic terms within three years. Um, you'll see a little change um, in last year's number. Just want to point that out for folks. Um, every year, um, we still have some degrees that have to be finalized through our evaluation process after our study session. And so last year, we were at 18 percent when we presented to the board, and it ticked up a little bit, and you'll see that also reflected in the increase in the number of degrees that were awarded. Um, but just over 19 percent for fall 2016 and just under 20 percent right now from the fall 2017 cohort, right, for that three-year completion timeline. And again, we'll still have some uh, final, uh, finalization of degrees uh, that take place as we move through October. And so um, we'll revise that percentage and update the board uh, as appropriate. Um, but you can see it's been um, a, a small increase, but really what we're excited and what we'll share with you this evening is we'll have our three-year completion rate for our Promise Scholars Program after this academic year. And based on our two year completion rate that we have so far, uh, in particular for our Skyline cohort, we've got some some really good news to share. And then finally, looking at the average time. Oh, please. Just to, be, a just to be clear, the 18 and percent and 19 percent, 19.8 percent numbers you're talking about is not the percentage of that cohort above, but that's the percentage of all students, correct? Uh, no, it's it's based on the the the, the first time full time cohort that entered. So this is looking at that three year cohort tracking. So tracking the the, the fall 2017 cohort out for three years since we've hit that three year timeline, and looking at the specifically degree completion. It's one of the conversations, and Trustee Mandelkern, as as Chancellor Kern mentioned, is one of the trustees on our uh, district strategic plan steering committee for our update. Um, we're looking at uh, expanding um, uh, some of our metrics and, and our completion metrics is one. Right now, though, focus primarily on degree completion. Um, as I mentioned to that group, um, I, 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 I do so uh, not, not necessarily reluctantly, but we always want to make sure that as we focus on completion, um, that students, if they have earned the degree, they take the degree with them before they leave. And so making sure that all of our guided pathways and our processes are aligned so that students can complete the degree, even if their intent is to transfer. The associate degrees for transfer really do help with that to the CSU system. Um, but uh, success after students leave isn't always guaranteed. And so we always want to make sure that they complete that degree when they're with us and take it with them. Um, but adding in also um, looking at certificate completion and transfer as its own separate metric or some of the revisions that we're looking at with the steering committee for the next round of district strategic plan metrics. Absolutely. And then finally, the time to completion. Um, we had a, a, a goal of, of six semesters. You see the note there if they take summer, it's counted as a half semester. And these are for folks who did complete the degree. How many semesters did it did it take? And, 
um, that number is coming down a little bit, and that's part of trying to get students through in a timely manner, right? If they do complete the degree, we don't want them to be taking longer than necessary um, for all the reasons that we know, the investment, time, resources, the, the lost potential earning power, um, and unit accumulation, which is um, not in our current metrics, but will definitely be part of um, our revision. And then moving on to our main completion um, indicators that are not cohort based. So these represent all, um, all the degrees and certificates and transfers for uh, those uh, specific academic years you see. And you see our associate degree completers um, continue to increase. And like I said, right now we have uh, just over 1,800 um, degree completers. Um, uh, but as we finish out October and into November, we'll probably have, see that number increase slightly. Um, just as the 1819 um, number increased a little bit um, from the last time we reported to the board. I did want to give the, the board a heads up on certificate completers. Um, while uh, we do have some certificates to finish awarding out, we will see a, a, um, a drop in the number of certificates that we award in the 1920 year. There's a few different reasons for that, but one of them being that um, we had been uh, combing our uh, 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 student records and, and doing some auto award of certificates for students who had earned them. And we've exhausted those cohorts. And so we're, we're gonna see a drop off for the 1920 year. Not sure exactly what that will be, but I um, wanted to just let you know that you will see a decrease in the number of certificate completers for the 1920 year um, in, in the next uh, update. Another and then our transfer numbers. Yes. Uh, when you talk about certificate completers, is that state certificate completers or all certificate completers? Great question and, and good clarification. So um, this, we include all certificates um, that are awarded by the district and recognized by the district. Um, it doesn't necessarily reflect just those recognized by the state chancellor's office, which have certain unit values that may be higher than some of our local certificates. I have a question on this one as well. Uh, are, yeah, these, Oliver. are these unduplicated numbers or if someone gets uh, two degrees, do you count them as two completions? Great question. So uh, we're specific here that these are the completers and not just the awards. So these are uh, unduplicated students. So individuals earning an award. Um, some students um, earn multiple degrees as well as multiple certificates, but these are the unduplicated student count. Yes. Thank you. And then looking below, we, we see our transfer numbers. Um, we continue to see, um, and, 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 and just for folks, we, we rely on report, reporting back from our CSU and UC um, uh, counterparts, which is why we do not have the 1920 transfers in yet, but our transfers to CSU continue to increase. We did see a slight uh, drop in UC transfers, um, but compared again to where we started uh, in the 15, 16 academic year since the strategic plan was put into place, um, we have been seeing a, a decent increase from that inaugural 15, 16 year. And then finally, um, the, the high school take rate. Um, we have seen a, a slight drop off in uh, the percent of graduates from the local high schools enrolling in the district at some point. Um, not, not entirely clear as to why. Um, this is a, a, a five year rolling average metric. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons, if I can speculate, um, uh, we, we often get students uh, returning to take courses um, even during the summer online with us as a district um, as the, the CSUs in particular have gotten better in their online education. Uh, they, we may have fewer of, of, our, of our former students or high school graduates needing to take courses from us. That's just a speculation. It's not entirely clear the, the slight percent drop off. However, I think this is one metric also that we'll want to uh, revisit in our discussion um, in our steering committee. Uh, question. Oh, well, oh, okay, thank you. Uh, so on these, and I guess this is sort of the standing request um, would be to disaggregate the uh, resident and non-resident uh, uh, transfers, as well as completions. Uh, would you know, uh, you know, not to put you on the spot, um, would you have that data? If not, can you please get it for us? Um, I, I don't have it, but absolutely, uh, Trustee Halberg can get that oh. and provide that. Uh, and I think as we discussed in the steering committee and, and uh, part of the your, your comments tonight as all the trustees um, will help us as we go into that metric revision of additional pieces of information that we'd like to see uh, moving forward. So 
we'll take that into account when we as we revise the metrics um, in our next meeting. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, if I if I may just elaborate a little bit because I know we've seen a leveling off or actually I guess a decrease right now in the international students and we don't know what the future may hold. But that's after we saw, you know, a fairly steady increase uh, for a few years. And um, those are really a very different uh, cohort of students than, you know, our California residents. So I think just to, to, to have uh, clarity, we need to see the numbers and define our goals for residents, not just for everyone, um, so that we're not masking, you know, areas where we may not be making as dramatic progress as, as we want to. Great, thank you. We'll definitely take that into the metric revision. I think Trustee Brendan had a question too. Uh, yep. I was just wondering uh, the, the take rate being uh, decreased, is that possible, uh, possibly because of uh, more students doing dual and concurrent enrollment in middle college and then just actually transferring to four year institutions? Um, earlier than they typically would? Um, it, it could be. Um, it, it, there's, there's any number of reasons, and that may be one, is they, they get enough experience in, in units, um, and we don't count them as, as um, uh, in our regular student count when they are enrolled in dual enrollment. They are considered K-12 concurrent enrollment students. Um, so that could be another uh, um, uh, positive aspect is, they gain units with us and just make the automatic transfer. Um, difficult to know though. It, it, it is difficult to know. It is one possibility. Is that something that we should be tracking or is that something that we are tracking? We just don't have the information connecting the dots. Um, Cause I do recall, I think we had our dual and concurrent enrollment number jump over the last three years. And then obviously with uh, Skyline having their new middle, middle college and those numbers um, actually being a part of kind of aligning with the um, decrease here. Yeah, we, we've, we've definitely seen a, a significant and exponential expansion of our dual enrollment numbers over the past two years. Um, thanks to the efforts of, you know, uh, Andrew Bisner at Skyline, Jennifer Taylor Mendoza as well. And so um, it is a possibility. I think this is definitely one metric that we can refine based on that, right? We want to, we want to be able to look at these metrics and, and kind of have a better understanding to Trustee Holliver's point. Is, is, is this indicative of something that we need to do and address or is it simply a, a trend that we don't actually have control over? And so getting more precise has been the theme in our metric discussion um, that we just had last week. So this is definitely one area to, to have better information on. And you'll see that also reflected in the revised goals. There's a lot uh, more interaction and engagement with high school partners to understand exactly where those students are going. Question. Question. Uh -huh. Uh, my question was uh, on the on the uh, subject of the high school transfers. Uh, to what extent do you think uh, the COVID situation, the fact that we did not have the face-to-face -face, uh, contact with counseling departments, uh, was our efforts or the efforts of the high school uh, counselors with the graduating seniors less robust than in the past? And perhaps did that have any effect? So for these numbers, um, that impact wouldn't be reflected yet. Um, the last number here from the 1819 year. Um, however, uh, and, and uh, the board will, will, will see it all next year. There's going to be an asterisk around every single number that is associated with the, the 1920 and 2021 year from here moving forward. What I will say is that the efforts to uh, do outreach with the high school specifically for dual enrollment were extremely robust this year. And we have seen a continued increase in dual enrollment because of that. Um, I, I, I personally know of over 200 plus Zoom meetings that had to be scheduled just to um, walk students through the concurrent enrollment application. Um, it was a tremendous shift of efforts in order to make sure that that engagement was still happening even in this virtual environment. Um, really uh, a credit to the efforts of, of folks um, uh, and, and up at Skyline um, to make sure that, that that connection wasn't lost even here in the COVID. So, um, we'll see what, what the, the end result of that is when we continue to update the metrics to the board. Um, I'm optimistic, though, that um, at least for our dual concurrent enrollment and high school transitions, that we've been able to maintain it. But the data will tell. The data will tell on that one. Thank you, Trustee Mayor. Question? Comment? I may. Yes, Trustee Mayor. Yes. Um, so uh, on, following on to that, I think another uh, trend I think would be interesting to keep an eye on, which I've been hearing about anecdotally from parents of high school students, is that there's some 
you know, sort of up in the air nature to the advanced placement courses at the high schools now, with COVID with the distance learning situation, and whether the advanced placement tests are actually going to be offered by the college board or not because of COVID and so forth. And I think that's driven some of those students who would ordinarily enroll in AP classes in the high school into dual enrollment to actually take a college course instead. I know that's been one of the sort of you know, persuasion arguments that we've, we've often had with the high school teachers and counselors about taking a college class rather than taking an exam to opt out of taking a college class. And that may be part of what we're seeing as well. That would be interesting to keep an eye on. My original question, however, was back to the transfer numbers. And I believe you mentioned these are the numbers that we're getting back from the state chancellor's office or from the CSU and the UCs directly. Um, yep. This has been one of my longstanding frustrations of, is there any way to track our non-UC and non-CSU transfers that we have? Uh, and I, I, I believe I see on the state chancellor's scorecard now that they are beginning to track non-UC and CSU transfers. I'm not sure where they're getting that data from, but I'm wondering if we should be adding that data in as well. And I believe in the last year I saw it was something like 250 uh, non-CSU and UC student transfers from reported from our district for the last cohort that they had the number. So it's not an insignificant number when you compare it with our, with our other transfer numbers here. Um, uh, it's absolutely something that we can add um, um, in our metrics revision. Um, uh, we do for other programs, we submit to the National Student Clearinghouse and get data back that includes not only the public, but also private, also out of state. Um, colleges, universities, so we can look and see if we'd like to include those as transfers uh, or include those transfer numbers in, in our, our next uh, revision of the scorecard, absolutely. Um, we used to get those numbers back from the states and they quit providing them a while ago. It's nice to see that they're going to be tracking them again, um, but it's something that we can do internally now and we have the capacity to. Great. All right. Um, so I want to move us along into to Act 2 if there's no more specific questions on the metrics, um, but I will just take a little pause to say that, uh, um, as Ch Chancellor Claire mentioned, we have been in a revision process um, that was going strong uh, right up until we hit March 17th and it got disrupted. We'd actually planned on bringing back a full revised strategic plan and set of metrics to this meeting, um, and now that, that timeline is stretched out, hopefully to January and no later. Um, for uh, the complete revision, including a new set of metrics. And these are the folks you see on the screen who are working on that. So just thanks to this group for um, sitting through all the meetings, for participating and for contributing a lot of, of, of great work and representing various groups, constituencies and all three colleges. And we will be taking all of these around um, uh, the revised metrics as well as what we'll show you next to the uh, academic senates, classified senates, uh, student senates, as well as the major planning and budget councils of each college for discussion before coming back with them. So I just wanna make sure that everyone knows that these are draft and in progress and, and we'll be making some additional revision. So President Swartz, unless you see any um, other questions right now, I'll move us on to uh, a review of some additional information. Nope. So one of the, Great. So I do want to lead us up to uh, the, the revised, the draft revised uh, goals and strategies for the district. Um, but I want to set that up with, with a review of some of the data that the steering committee looked like. And we looked at a lot. We spent an entire almost two hour session doing an environmental scan deep dive. And one of the things that you'll see as a consistent theme in the revised um, strategic plan goals and strategies is really this continued focus on completion and the importance of completion of, of a, not only the associate's degree, but even the bachelor's degree. And so I put this first slide up. This comes from the quick facts from the US Census. Always important to fill out that census. And it shows the educational attainment by race and ethnicity here in San Mateo County. And you, 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 will, you will often hear that we have a very uh, high education attainment rate uh, compared to other areas. But as you see here, again, it is an equity issue when we look at the different demographics, the different groups who are able to um, secure that bachelor's degree in particular. And so if you, you see our, our, our Hispanic or Latinx communities, African-American, Black communities, American Indian, Native Hawaiian communities aren't uh, achieving the bachelor's degree at the same rate as uh, Asian and white counterparts, not to essentialize these categories, but just to point out that the attainment of the bachelor's degree and is not uh, even among all groups in San Mateo County. 
And so when we talk about the importance of completion, we keep this in mind that educational attainment really is an equity issue in particular in San Mateo. And these next few slides that I'll show you kind of highlight some of the reasons why we're focused on completion so much. Um, this data comes from the Silicon Valley Index, some folks may be familiar with, um, last updated in, in 2018. This first slide shows what the high school graduation rates are broken down by race and ethnicity. And as you see again, moving from left to right, that we see a drop in successful high school graduation re rates for some of our Hispanic Latinx communities, African American, Black communities, Pacific Islander, et cetera. And so high school graduation becomes an equity issue. Part of our reasons of reaching into the high schools with dual enrollment is because we know that those programs help to facilitate not only high school graduation, but then transition into higher education. But even if students are graduating, this, this next slide looks at how many students complete those UC and CSU requirements, otherwise commonly known as the A through G requirements. Um, and here we see even greater disparities um, when we're looking at this through an equity lens. Um, and a, a significant drop off as we move to our, again, Hispanic Latinx communities, American Indian, African American communities. Um, when we talk about um, structures of education um, that are not set up to achieve the same outcomes for different groups of students, uh, the, the achievement of the H or G requirements is, is, is a big highlight in that gap. President Swartz? No. Oh. Sorry, it came off mute. I thought you were going. Got it. Oh no. I'll continue. Uh, question. Uh, <laughs> oh, there you go, Trustee Oliver. <laughs> is this, I knew um, there was one. Yeah, is this San Mateo County? It says Silicon Valley. So is that uh, Santa Clara as well? Great question. So the Silicon Valley Index um, includes San Francisco County, San Mateo County, and Santa Clara County as their three-county regional look. So this represents the three counties of the peninsula. Yeah. And so we look at this in the Other A through question. G requirements. And absolutely. Question. Yes. So this is this is interesting data, and this is sort of the first you know, that I've seen of this at least in a while, because uh, it ties into the overall in San Mateo County our percentage of high school graduates who go on to whether it's a community college or a four year college uh, is about sixty five percent, which is about where you know your overall line here is showing roughly in that in that range. Um, and so it raises the interesting question is, are a lot of those students not going on because they're not academically prepared to go on and then that they don't meet the A2G requirements as opposed to they've just, they found a job or whatever, you know, they, they have they don't have the desire to go on to college or whatever. I'm wondering if there's any insight into that of, is there, is there a gap between those who are interested in going on and are not academically prepared as opposed to those who just have no interest in going on to higher education? Um, Absolutely, and, and there's nuance in that as well. Um, and, and when we say academic, academically prepared, uh, you know, when I think about it for A through G, it's the, in, the institution's responsibility to academically prepare the students. And so, you know, one of the things that we know is um, some students are not viewed as likely to go on to CSU or UC, and so may not be advised into courses that meet the A through G requirements. Um, it's an issue that we know exists, and it, it, it's not to um, criticize any of the high school partners that work to get students to graduate. It's simply a recognition of the data shows that there is absolutely an equity issue and disparity here. And yes. if a student hasn't completed the A through G requirements, they may not, number one, they're not automatically on that transfer path to the CSU right out of high school. And so they may decide that, well, maybe community college isn't worth it. I am going to go into the workplace. But this also tells us that we, these students who are not meeting the HRG requirements are also more likely to be the students that are going to need us as the district to provide that entrance into higher education um, for whatever reason that they weren't able to complete those requirements in their high school experience. And so when we look at our representation, it's, it's definitely reflected here. So we look at, this is specifically the San Mateo County, looking at the race ethnicity of the county compared to that of our district and it was in the most recent academic year we looked at in the strategic plan. So this is from our last academic year. And you can see that we definitely have a, a, an over-representation of our Hispanic Latinx community here in the district. And part of that I would attribute to the fact that 
they're not being they're not being able to complete those A through G requirements, so they definitely need to access higher education through our community college system. And, and it continues to put for me, at least, and I know for many of us, it continues to just highlight the importance of providing that access. But ultimately, not just the access, but the completion. And so when we talk about the strategic plan, really the focus is continuing to be on completion. This, this slide here is, is for Santa Clara and San Mateo County specifically. Aaron, can I ask a question? Absolutely, well, Trustee Nurse. Um, going back to that, uh, the subject of people not really uh, finishing what they need to do in high school, uh, I guess really this, this takes us to the fact that the discussion needs to go beyond high schools as well, because um, having spent many years in that setting, uh, many, many, many high schools, especially in our area, are receiving ninth graders that are reading at the fourth and fifth grade level, if maybe not even lower. And so by the time they get to high school, there's no longer any retention anymore in elementary schools. And they come into high school reading and, uh, and performing at uh, at, at significantly lower levels uh, in the four years that the high schools have them, they don't have enough time to get them up to speed and get them through those, through those particular, particular requirements that we were talking about. So um, if, uh, if we're going to then inherit then students that the problem just gets compounded, let's just put it that way. So in order to really deal with it, we need to get to the root cause of it, which means we need to articulate more with the feeder districts, not only the high school level, but at the elementary school level uh, to see what we can do to, to have people performing at the levels they're supposed to before they get to the community colleges. But the reality is, is we have to deal with what we have, uh, so we deal with it, but looking forward in order to help uh, create a, a better situation coming into our colleges, we need to work with our feeders. I wholeheartedly agree with Trustee Nurris. If you think a solution is a bolt-on that we can do when someone is a junior in high school or a senior in high school, that's way too late. I mean, really going back to middle school or even before into elementary school is where you have to start to address the problems. Thank you for that, Trustee Nurris, Trustee Mandelker. And, and, and absolutely, the, 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 the attention and the investment has to be all the way down into, uh, you know, as, as the first five years of reading. And for us, it is what can we do and how, how can we engage and at what level. Um, and part of our, our efforts right now through dual enrollment is really to get down at least into the high school level and to continue to reach down and to, to collaborate all the way up to uh, help as many students be um, prepared as possible. But we can't do it alone, can we, right? So this, this is really the, the, the big effort of all of our feeder districts working with us and participating, because this is, this is it right here. As we look at median income by educational attainment, this is, this is where the stark reality begins to hit and why we continue to focus so much on our completion agenda as a district. Um, the, the box on the right shows what the kind of the, the, the ratio, the impact of having a bachelor's degree is in Silicon Valley, Santa Clara, San Mateo, San Francisco specifically, and then California. Um, and if you look, the impact is greater here because more of our economy requires at least a bachelor's degree just to access the economy. Um, I, I, I tell folks that, you know, I went to, to Shasta College up in Shasta County and in Redding, California. The need for a bachelor's degree and the impact of a bachelor's degree is not the same as it is in San Mateo. County. There, you can access the economy with a high school diploma much easier. And so this is the disparity that exists of students who aren't achieving an associate's degree. But really that bachelor's degree then level is where it begins to jump up. And so we, that is our focus on continuing to promote not only transfer, but what can we do to really help make sure that there are also four-year options for students in San Mateo County so they can access not only the degree, but then eventually this economy. If, trust me, uh, Chancellor McQueen, if, uh, Vice Chancellor McQueen, um, if I may add on to that, it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. If, if perhaps you can go back for one slide, uh, it's not just that the bachelor's degree leads to higher income. It's, as you mentioned, just to be able to participate in the economy, to get those higher paying jobs, you have to have that educational level. And in, in a very you know, sort of knowledge rich economy like we have here in the middle of Silicon Valley in San Mateo County, if you don't have that educational attainment, you're probably not going to be able to make enough money to afford to live here. 
And so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that if you don't provide the educational opportunity, you don't, you don't have the ability to make the income necessary to be able to live here. And so you either have a very low standard of living or you are forced out of the geographical area because of it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, um, when we talk about a strategic plan focused on equity and social justice, this is, this is the ultimate impact is looking at per capita incomes, all of these metrics. And when we review them, they all do go together. Is, is if students can't access higher education, if they can't complete the bachelor's degree, first starting with the associate's degree, there are income disparities by race and ethnicity that have to be acknowledged. And this is where we turn to our district to help address these disparities by focusing on completion for students. Um, because this is the reality of the impact on income for different groups in our counties and in particular our communities of color not being able to achieve the same income levels because they have been systematically excluded uh, and from higher education which is why that is a major focus not only this year but of our strategic plan is to disrupt that pattern and break down those barriers the last slide I wanted to share that we looked at just as setting up our, our, our review of, of strategies um, was the unemployment realities as well. And at the time this came out, those unemployment rates were so low that almost no one paid attention to it. But historically, when unemployment rates aren't low, there's also disparities. And right now, um, the most recent data I saw, at least for San Mateo County, is we have a, just over an 11% unemployment rate in the county. I think 11.7% was the latest number I saw. And this, you can almost bet, while they didn't disaggregate, that that's going to impact our communities of color to a greater extent, because it historically always has. And the work of the Workforce Task Force, um, Tom Bauer leading that work with Jonathan Bissell, Andrea Bisner, Alex Kramer, um, uh, Adrian uh, or Julian Branch down at Kenyatta. Um, their work is even highlighted now because folks are unemployed and do need to be able to return to work. And uh, that's a, an immediate response, but it's about getting those folks also to completion so they, they can access this economy. So I want to shift there to our what I consider our first review for the board of, of the revised goals and strategies. I'm not gonna read every single um, uh, thing that are, is on the slides. I wanna make sure we get to our promised folks who've been, who are with us this evening. But I did wanna include this and it's included in your packet in the report because uh, we have an opportunity uh, um, to continue to refine these uh, between now and January when we hope to bring them back for a final read. And so, as the steering committee, we went into a deep dive of information. We reviewed the strategic plans from the colleges. We went through this environmental scan and SWOT analysis process. And this is what we have drafted as our revised goals and strategies for the strategic plan. We started out with district-wide strategies um, that are kind of overarching, that may be timely, um, but that kind of focus and aren't located under any particular goal. Uh, we want to continue to be able to evaluate the impact of our efforts to make sure that we know whether or not they're increasing our, our metrics that we develop. Guided pathways still have to be fully implemented across the district. Resources to continue to, uh, uh, resources to um, continue to help innovate in teaching and learning. Um, fully implementing our Salesforce CRM is, is definitely a, a district-wide strategy that, that we hope to achieve in this next round of strategic planning. And then, and I hope Joe Fullerton is on the, the, the Zoom here somewhere, also making sure that we are supporting sustainability as a district and keeping that as a focus, um, always highlighted by the potential for the rolling blackouts this evening that we might see across the county and needing to have sustainable sources of, of power, but also decrease our reliance on, 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 on the grid to some extent. So these are our overarching strategies. And then we got into the individual goals themselves. And the goals kind of align around areas of access and success, partnerships for completion, technology for innovation, and then of course resources to support everything that we want to achieve. And so you see here, and one of the things we talked about at our last meeting was in reading through these, all of these read just a little bit different here in this pandemic situation, because we, I think we recognize what was needed in online education and delivery of online services and remote services, 
but we really didn't have a, a good idea, but we have a much better idea of what is actually absolutely needed now and the resources that we need to support it. And so a lot of these focused on online web-based options for students for advising and counseling um, and the strengthening of those interventions that are going to lead to success. Um, we also focus on that pathway, idea, uh, the pathways through the ESL sequence, focus on success in our transfer level English and math. All of these are really looking at the interventions designed to increase success in students and increase access for students to the services that we know are successful based on our evaluation. As we moved into strategic goal two, this is really about that whole continuum from our high school partners to our institution, then up through our four-year partnerships. So continuing to increase collaboration for early college, middle college, concurrent enrollment and dual enrollment opportunities, really promoting the collaboration, faculty, faculty collaboration so that our guided pathways can start all the way in junior year of, of high school and continue all the way up through our guided pathways here in the district as we finish implementing those over this next strategic plan iteration. Continuing to work at feeder high schools, as, as we mentioned, to streamline that process, that sharing, sharing transcript information so we have a better idea of, of what we can expect for the transition from high school districts, and to expand as many partnerships then upward into the four-year realm, whether that looks like a, a four-year option in the county, whether that's increasing our four-year degrees at our colleges through advocacy at the state level, or bringing on programs at our colleges in that university center model, whatever it is that we can to provide that four-year access here is also part of this. And the, again, highlighted in the data that we just reviewed of the importance of that. Aaron, As we if, went into if I could, oh, yes. Sorry, Aaron, if, if I could just comment, and, and I think part of that in terms of looking at our data and looking at our transfers, while we celebrate the students that are going to, you know, um, upper tier schools, the reality is most of our students are going to our local CSU. So I, I think a big part of our work involves doing really um, detailed work with our major transfer institutions. That really would be San Francisco State and CSU East Bay and to a certain extent San Jose State. And I can tell you that at least two of the, the one president, the CSU East Bay president is retiring, but I, we had the opportunity to meet with the new president of San Francisco State, and I feel really good. I think we have a ready and willing partner in that work. So I, I just want to add that. I think that's going to make a, an impact in terms of uh, transferability down the road. Absolutely. And it's, it's really articulating those programs that are designed specifically to transfer there and, and continuing to build those relationships. So we definitely look forward to doing that over the, the course of this next strategic plan iteration. So really strategic goal number three is really focused on innovation and excellence in instruction. And, you know, you read these and these were, you know, we had drafted these before we, we went away for the, the, the pandemic break. Uh, but now they read a little more intensely to develop online education, increase the development of certificate degree programs, uh, incorporate advances in, in technology and provide the professional development support that's needed so that, that we can continue to raise the game for online instruction and ensure that uh, all of our student and academic support services are accessible to all students, both in the technical sense and in the availability sense in the online realm, uh, because we recognize the impact that that has on not just success, but equity and, and achievement. And then finally, goal four really then focuses down on, on the resources that, that are going to be needed. You know, we, we want to continue to uh, uh, advocate to maintain our, our, our status as a community supported district. We want to increase, the, uh, continue to increase uh, alternative revenue sources to support all of the programs that we know we need. And we'll talk about that with our Promise Scholars program in a minute. Expand grant uh, funding strategy as well as increase philanthropic development. Um, and really just tr continue to increase all these options to provide more resources and to engage our community. Um, that's reflected in the uh, com community continuing corporate education focus that continues potential credit, non-credit hybrid options. All of this is about continuing to engage our community so we can continue to have the support of this county that we have enjoyed and really our students have benefited from. And so that is the, the, the first review of our goals and strategies. As was mentioned, Trustee Mandelkern and Trustee Nurse are both on the steering committee. 
I'm happy to take in suggested areas of revision um, at our next steering committee meeting if any of other trustees would like to contribute um, their thoughts or any areas that they think that we have overlooked. Um, but really want to thank that steering committee. And like I said, we'll be going out to the colleges for their input on these strategic goals and strategies to see if from the college perspective, um, if we've missed anything essential. But with that, I really want to turn it over to our Promise Scholars Program, if there's no specific questions for me, and make the transition to Act 3. <laughs> Seeing none? All yeah. right. Yeah. I, I am thrilled to turn this over to Dr. Lauren Ford. She's our Interim Director of Strategic Initiatives and Planning at the, at the District and Educational Services and Planning, and she has brought a, a group of folks here to, to, to share tonight. So, Dr. Ford, please take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. McBean. Good evening, members of the board, President Schwartz, uh, Chancellor Claire, President's colleagues, community members, Promise folks. Um, we see you out there on the attendees list. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I am pleased to be able to share with you an update on our Promise Scholars Program, um, thinking about all the hard work and amazing work that our Promise team and our Promise students have done um, especially over the past year and excited to share some really great um, outcomes that we're seeing even early on in our PROMISE implementation. So I will go ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, as I do this, I do want to also note that we have uh, the PROMISE directors are here with us today. So from Skyline College, we have Ellen Murray, um, the PROMISE Scholars Program Director, uh, at College of San Mateo, Tiffany Zamet, the Director of High School Transitions and Dual Enrollment, and also uh, from Kenyatta College, Myra Ariano, uh, who is also the Director of High School Transitions and Dual Enrollment. So they are here and they're able to kind of jump in and answer questions as they may arise. Okay, so I hope my screen is sharing okay. Um, so again, my name is Lauren Ford. I'm the Interim Director of Strategic Planning uh, strategic initiatives in planning and um, just want to provide for you first kind of an overview of the Promise Scholars Program and, and how we got to where we are today. Um, we started in 2016 with our pilot cohort at Skyline College of about 139 students and this cohort was really essential for us to just figure out how do we even start? How do we start with offering a fee waiver? What does this look like? What are all of the components that we might need to provide a full-fledged completion program to support our students in being able to um, get through their programs in two to three years. After that, in 2017, we started um, a technical assistance relationship with the CUNY ASAP team, which we do have a member of that team here today um, who can share a little bit more about what that looked like. But that uh, 2017 year allowed us to really expand our efforts uh, in thinking about what does a scholarship and counseling look like? How can we support a few more students, so 253, and start really thinking about what replication of this evidence-based um, completion model would look like within not only our district, but in California as a whole, right? There are some um, really key differences just uh, between the way in which, you know, things might happen in New York versus the way they happen in California, even thinking about, you know, transferring from uh, the community college to four years, the systems are different. And so all of that um, we were taking into consideration as the Promise team at Skyline did a deep dive within technical assistance with the CUNY ASAP team. Um, that year of technical assistance allowed for us to really expand the Promise Scholars program um, and start an official ASAP replication with our fall 2018 cohort at Skyline, but also start our pilot program at the College of San Mateo and Kenyatta College, where we expanded our efforts to be able to provide not only the fee waivers for students that um, still had a need after any financial aid was applied, books, thinking about monthly uh, incentives, whether it's transportation or food, having dedicated counselors, um, workshops and engagements throughout the semester to really um, build and maintain relationships with students and, and keep them engaged and on track to completion. And so the fall 2018 cohort was really our first year 
um, to be able to have this full-fledged, holistic, kind of full support program uh, for our students within Promise Scholars. So then it comes to the fall 19 uh, cohort where we started and truly expanded it to serve up to 2,000 students. I think we were just shy of 2,000 across the district at all of our colleges. So 750 at CSM, 750 at um, Skyline College and 500 at Kenyatta. And, and the fall 2019 is with when CSM and Kenyatta College started their technical assistance support with the CUNY ASAP team. That technical assistance is really vital and to be able to understand the ASAP model, understand what it looks like within our campuses, identify what types of support, um, collaboration might be needed across the campus and the district, um, as well as what type of training might come from it for our counselors, our staff, um, and even our administrators to really understand what, how does this model work and how is it so effective. And so with that, we got together and we got together often. And so um, from monthly phone calls with our CUNY ASAP counterparts, um, we were able to also get together in April in New York to learn more about what does ASAP look like on the ground, right? Uh, I see Aaron's face. We missed being able to go to New York again this year because it was right when the pandemic started and we all got grounded um, in place. But that's okay because we're still able to get together virtually and engage. Um, the picture that you see on your screen is from last October uh, when the CUNY ASAP team came to Skyline College and we held a district-wide uh, ASAP Promise counselor training um, so that all Promise counseling faculty and, and staff um, and even administrators were able to, again, dive deeply into the Promise Scholars model uh, really understand kind of how this operates, how this works, and to share promising practices with one another. And there might be some faces in there that you might not recognize, and those are actually our partners from Lake Tahoe Community College, Pasadena City College, and Cuesta College, which were exploring the replication of the Promise Scholars Program uh, as a part of the Higher Education Innovation Act that we actually won from the Chancellor's Office a few years ago to expand the PSP replication efforts. And so they've been joining us along this journey to think about what promise could look like even within their campuses. Um, and it's been a really great opportunity to share our knowledge about how we were able to translate this New York model into the California context. And so with that, I want to invite uh, Christine Braginiart, the University Executive Director of CUNY ASAP ACE, to share a little bit about the experiences um, that, that they've seen on the ASAP side about the success of the program, but also how our technical assistance has worked. So, Christine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Thank you for inviting me and good evening, everybody. It's, it's really such an honor and privilege for me to join you all and at least reflect a little bit about our relationship and the journey that we've been taking alongside um, the San Mateo County Community College District and, uh, and really helping us you know, kind of flex our own muscles in terms of testing the ASAP model beyond our very unique uh, CUNY context. So my name is Christine Bronyart. I'm the University Executive Director of CUNY ASAP. And um, right now, um, we are 14 cohorts in to our ASAP scaled existence. We serve 25,000 students per academic year, over nine partner colleges, um, six community colleges, and three comprehensive colleges. And um, at this current scale, we're essentially serving just over a third of the, the full-time associate degree seeking population across the university system. So it's so interesting to hear Lauren talk about the trajectory of growth and scale across the San Mateo County Community College District in that, you know, it's really taken us some number of years to kind of build and, um, you know, build to the current scale. And that really is um, very much on the, um, on the shoulders of our of our evidence base that we've been very very attuned to building from inception. So our funding is 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 generously provided by the city of New York. We're baseline funded by the city, even in this most contentious fiscal climate. Um, it took some active advocacy on the part of our electeds, um, our city council members, very vocal faculty, students, staff, etc. But we were 
fully restored to continue to operate at our current scale of 25,000 students. And again, that's only made possible because of our, our evidence base and our ability to demonstrate our doubling effect on three-year completion rates um, for our program students. So we do continue to double uh, the rates of our program students when compared to a, a matched comparison group of students. We maintain an average graduation rate of about 54.4%. Um, versus 24.6% of that matched comparison group. Um, and so, you know, we, we continue to, you know, demonstrate these outcomes. Again, we continue to be funded at our current scale of 25,000 students per academic year. And of course, that in turn, yielding many more graduates over time, has this very kind of dramatic effect on the CUNY overall three-year completion rate. So again, as um, we progress, by 2022, um, it's projected that we'll boost that overall CUNY three-year grad rate uh, to 34%, and that's coming up almost doubling that, um, that three-year rate from a baseline of the fall 2013 cohort of 17.8%. Very excited that we're able to kind of maintain this momentum. Not only is our program kind of proven to be highly effective within CUNY, it's also proven to be highly adaptable. We're applying the model to different contexts and different populations, um, applying it to the baccalaureate setting where we're really looking to double the four-year completion rate at our senior colleges. Um, adaptable population where we're applying the model to part-time students so we can really boost academic momentum. And again, you know, on top of adaptability, replicability was always something that we were really looking to test and we couldn't have done that um, any more effectively, um, you know, than with our partners in San Mateo County. Um, you know, we really had dabbled in replication. Um, we, we were able to demonstrate some um, effectiveness or noted effectiveness um, through our demonstration work in Ohio. MDRC released that report of the three-year findings of the RCT where we replicated the model at three Ohio community colleges. And it really did boost full-time enrollment, semester to semester persistence, um, increase the number of credits attempted and earned. Very similar findings and outcomes that we found um, also within CUNY um, ASAP. So, you know, again, it was just a matter of now kind of seeing how we would be able to build replication in a, in a scaled model. So San Mateo has really provided that, um, being able to really um, assess, um, you know, the ways in which this program can be accessed by the entire eligible cross-section and population of your district. It really, it's really been a unique partnership to see the commitment to equity and access and scale that, that the district has taken from the very onset of replication. I'd say in addition to their vision for scale, you know, I really say that your work um, in our replication partnership has really been about translating the model again into your context and really negotiating kind of the contours of the, the different ways in which the program has to be adapted, but without say, sacrificing fidelity. So just as an example, the critical role of the ASAP advisor, being able to translate that role into the PSP counseling faculty context you know, this is already providing a roadmap into the ways in which the PSP program can be rolled up even more broadly across the California system, potentially. I just also wanted to just take a moment to really commend, um, you know, Lauren in particular for really being such a stellar documentarian of all the lessons learned over these last three years. As you'll probably hear, there's just been so much um, really fine attuned detail to the ways in which this program, again, can continue to grow, be adapted, be modeled for other community colleges across the state. So it really does have this powerful benefit to the entire California community college system and students across your state. So um, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to just kind of, you know, articulate the great value that the program has had, PSP has had on ASAP, has helped us kind of think about the different ways in which we can continue with our replication work and our technical assistance work. And uh, we really do view, view the skyline and as the frontier program of, of what we're trying to model as, you know, continued demonstration projects that would replicate this model nationwide. So with that, thank you for the time. And I look forward to hearing more about your early outcomes. Okay, thank you so much for joining us, Christine, and for staying online uh, all the way from New York. I know it's late there, but we appreciate your support um, and your advocacy for the program. 
um, and just the opportunity to collaborate in so many different areas to make both programs even stronger. So thank you so, so very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so um, with that, with the technical assistance, um, it, it's still ongoing. Um, the work that we're doing together, including even next week, we have a virtual convening uh, where all of the replication partners, um, including folks from Ohio, from West Virginia, from Tennessee, that are replicating the ASAP model, uh, will be joined together to really kind of learn from one another about how we've been able to adopt the model, how we're able to serve uh, communities that have been underserved in the past, and how we've adapted uh, within this, this time of COVID and virtual learning, how we're looking at our data, um, as well as getting more insights on uh, the ACE program that Christina was just talking about, which is serving the senior colleges, so translating it to the four-year uh, colleges and universities and how do we serve part-time students within this model and so that's something we're really looking forward to next week if any of the board members would like to attend please let me know i'm happy to send you an invitation um, to to learn more about the amazing work that that we're doing so i mentioned just the, our overall growth um, as a whole from year to year and i just wanted to kind of highlight what that has looked like by campus um, you'll notice in 2019, uh, in the fall of 2019, we're kind of at our maximum, uh, our goals in terms of how many students that we could support. Again, at Kenyatta is about 500, CSN and Skyline was 750. Um, for the fall of 2020 term, we did see a dip in the number of students that are in the program. And that is in large part due to um, COVID and uh, the, the pandemic as a whole and how that is impacting our students. Um, and so I think that that goes kind of in line with what uh, Dr. McVean was sharing earlier within just overall enrollments and um, challenges, you know, that students have been able to share with us um, and the, the challenge that that comes with in enrolling in classes versus um, needing to work or, or any other areas that might take them away from that primary identity as students. Uh, some of these students that um, may be missing from this chart are still in touch with our programs. Um, they just perhaps needed to take a semester off while they were focusing on their own personal uh, situations. Uh, again, work or uh, for mental health purposes, to support their families, um, things like that. And so we are holding those spots for those students to be able to come back um, in the spring, we hope, if not, then in the fall, so that we can continue to support them within the program. Our overall demographics of our students, um, our student population is a majority first generation, low income students. We really wanted to make it a point to serve students um, that were low income and first generation for many of the points that Dr. McVean shared earlier and just being able to have that access to higher education so that, you know, in turn, having earning that degree, being able to go into the workforce or to transfer and then change the lives of not only that student, but also their, their families and their community members. Um, when it comes to the racial and ethnicity breakdown, um, the, our Latinx and Hispanic population is by far our largest uh, student demographic within the Promise Scholars Program as a whole. And that is still reflective of our demographics as a district, right? And so, you know, we have Hispanic serving institutions within our district, so it is no surprise that our Promise Scholars Program reflects that as well. And so that's all who's in the program. So what is this program, <laughs> right? So the Promise Scholars Program, we are a completion program. Um, and in order to help support our students complete, um, we're, we support students that are able to study full-time, um, that are first-time students, um, but providing them with these three areas of support for up to three years. And so there's financial support, academic support, and counseling support. The financial support is often that hook that kind of gets them in. Oh, wow, you can pay for my college, you can pay for my tuition, my books, and I get $50 a month. Like, this sounds amazing, right? That's that financial support that really is able to uh, lift a barrier that has per, uh, previously uh, per, prevented access for especially our low income communities to be, because it's more than just tuition often. The expensive books gets very um, expensive. How do they get to campus? 
Um, the transportation incentive can be extremely beneficial. And so um, that's the financial support. They also uh, are able to access academic support like priority registration where they can register for their classes early. Um, blocked courses is something that we're doing now across the district where they can have access to take classes with other members of their cohort to really create that additional sense of community. Um, early onboarding uh, that may look uh, a bit different at each campus, but is really dedicated to ensuring that students are able to join the college um, and have access to the different supports, resources, and really know who are these folks that are going to help me throughout the next three uh, years or so. And so it's connecting them to not only the, the program, but also each other, right? Because the students do serve as support for one another as well. And then finally, and this is probably the most impactful piece of the program, is that counseling support. And so the Promise Scholars Program, um, based on the ASAP model, works on a maximum student to counselor ratio of 150 students to one, which is a much lower ratio than our general counseling provides. And this is because of the tiered support model that is integral to this particular program. And so students that might be in their first semester or maybe they're their last semester and they're about to graduate or students that may have had some challenges with their academics in between <laughs> when they start and when they're graduating, they may meet with their counselor more often so that they can check in, make sure that they're on track and really have a plan to success. Students that might be in their second year, they made all A's last year and they're doing great, life is good. They might meet with their counselor like twice a semester. Um, and so it's really kind of the support model that our counselors and our program staff take very seriously in being able to provide um, great assessments to students because they've been able to develop these relationships over time and really get to know who the students are and know what type of support that student may need. So in addition, there's workshops, there's group events, there's an access to career development and support. So it's really kind of this full-fledged um, program um, that students are able to tap into. And so again, we keep iterating this idea that it's a completion program. And so the expectation is that students will enroll in at least 12 units every semester, um, every fall and spring. And if in order to kind of stay on that two year or three year timeline, uh, they may also take a few summer classes as well, complete financial aid every year, participate in the program elements, including that check-in with the counselors, uh, tutoring if that's something that the counselor would recommend to be beneficial for them, so on and so forth. And so those are the traditional expectations. I'll talk a little bit about how that has shifted a bit um, with our current situation due to the pandemic. Um, but that's typically what the student is there expected to do in um, kind of in relation to the benefits of the program. We, we are seeking to double the graduation rates, right, that have, we have historically seen within our district. Um, and so we created benchmarks, and these benchmarks are actually those that Christine was talking about within the, the ASAP program of a 25% two-year rate, a 50% three-year graduation rate. Um, and these benchmarks are our goals that we're trying to achieve to really ensure that we're giving our students um, the best opportunity to achieve their two and three-year goals as possible. So what? So what does all of this mean? Right, I'm sure you're wondering, you wanna know what have we done? Well, let's go through some benchmarks. Our persistence, so this is just looking at from the fall of year one to fall to year two. Um, the benchmark is about 80%. We'd like to see 80% of our students from fall to fall return. Within our fall 18 cohort from fall to fall, um, we were just about at our benchmark, right? So Skyline was 83%, CSM was at 80%, Kenyatta was a little bit lower at 77%. Um, for fall 2019 to fall 2020, this is where we saw a dip. And again, because of the pandemic and the way in which this shook out. And so many of the students that we saw um, that needed to just kind of take a pause from enrollment are from the fall 2019 cohort. Um, that's where a majority of them are from. And so the persistence in this case did shift a bit. And I think that this goes to Dr. McVean's point again um, earlier that this particular year, calendar year, just kind of has an asterisk next to it, right? There's nothing particularly wrong 
with this number, but it is the reality of where we are because of the reality of where we are, right? Um, and just knowing that our students um, are going through a lot, just like all of us. And so we've seen that um, kind of reflect in the data here. So that's the reality of this particular benchmark. However, I want to share with you some success that we've seen. So thinking about our two-year completion rate, um, and really our goal to double our historical rate, on the slide here, you'll see our fall 2018 cohort two-year completion. The yellow bar, uh, it represents our associate's degree earners. And so the goal of the program is really to help students earn that degree, right? Um, for Kenyatta, there was an increase based on students that uh, were enrolled at Kenyatta College, first time, full time students starting in 2016 when we didn't have a Promise Scholars program, right? So we've seen an increase there. At CSM, it almost doubled that rate for associate degree earners. Skyline almost quadrupled, right, that rate for associate degree earners. And so the work that the Promise Scholars teams are doing is really showing here. It's really showing up in terms of the amount of students that are able to get through the program in two years in order to achieve their goal and earn their degree. I also want to point out that for the fall 2018 cohort, that was um, the year prior to Kenyatta College and uh, College of San Mateo participating in that technical assistance, that extra support that the CUNY ASAP team brought on. So there's still different components to the program that we're rolling out throughout those times. And so I think that um, as we continue to progress within uh, the program, these numbers will only increase uh, just based on our knowledge and our awareness, the things that we're learning from the technical assistance, um, as well as just from one another to be able to really help students achieve this two-year goal. So I just wanna give a shout out and kudos to the Promise Scholars team um, in being able to get us to this point. This is, I mean, fantastic. Um, if you were to add up all of the numbers, Kenyatta's completion is about 15%, CSM is 20%, and Skyland is a 30%. And that includes students that didn't earn a degree and they transferred and students that earned certificates. So it's still a fantastic um, opportunity to, to share kind of the success of the program thus far. So some quick updates about the fall 2020 you know, and kind of where we are. Obviously, all program uh, components are remote, so that includes our counseling appointments, uh, our check-ins with students, um, workshops, all of the different aspects of the program, tutoring, um, is everything is remote, including our incentives. And so we're utilizing digital uh, monthly incentives that are grocery store gift cards. Um, since we're not in person, can't do like clipper cards and things like that that we had done um, on campus in the past. We are uh, being a bit more flexible in the re enrollment requirements. Traditionally, we do um, <laughs> require that students are enrolled in at least 12 units, right, to be full-time students within the program. Uh, this fall, we're seeing about 24% of students that are taking less than 12 units, a majority of whom are between 9 and 11, and so they're close to that 12. Um, but this is, again, in large part because of the need to either work or to support family or um, for mental health purposes or even um, athletics and thinking about continuing eligibility and what that might mean um, for their opportunities to transfer, all of that plays a part in um, enrollment. There were some students I mentioned before that needed to take a pause um, specifically due to the pandemic and the issues that have arisen um, as a result of that. And so we're seeing that as well. And again, we're, we're holding those students' spots um, and figuring out right now a, a plan of action to support them both in their return um, as well as once they get back, um, just supporting them to stay on track to complete their goals. And then finally, we have uh, begun an evaluation effort, um, an official external evaluation effort with West Ed, who is a nonprofit research development and service agency based here in California. 
um, that is really the leading expert on all things California College Promise. They are leading the research um, in this area on Promise, um, as well as a part of the national conversation on College Promise as well. So we're really tapped into an amazing network of experts um, on evaluating Promise programs and their effectiveness and part of that includes our ability to translate the ASAP model um, with fidelity into a California context. So some points of consideration um, as we come to the board, just thinking about, you know, what is this program? What, what are things that we need to be successful? What does this look like for our future? Um, sustainability is always number one. And so thinking about how do we continue to maintain this amount of um, support for students uh, for a program that is doing what it came here to do, helping students get through um, and earn their associate's degree in two years, three at the max. Um, and so from the, the state chancellor's office, uh, those AB19 dollars at 1.4 million um, has been a huge part of our budget to support this program. However, there are potential budget cuts coming from the chancellor's office due to this pandemic. And so I know that for me, for our Promise team, there is kind of this, um, you know, concern about what happens when that number goes down. I'm not, I don't want to say it's going to go away. Let's not <laughs> bring that in here. But what if it goes down? Then, then how do we maintain the support of this program um, to be able to support our students? How might we be able to have access to flexible dollars so that if the those state funds go down, what else might we be able to use instead to support the direct aid to students, so the fee waivers or the incentives that we are able to provide for students? Um, and then how do we maintain our, our staffing support? Thinking about that 150 to 1 um, caseload, that's really kind of the crux of this program and being able to uh, provide that dedicated support to students. Um, is by having the, the right folks in place and enough of those right folks in place to be able to provide that level of, of attention, of support, uh, to build those relationships to really guide our students to our success. And so these are always kind of points to, to think about um, as we have this conversation with you all uh, and kind of where the program is headed. Cancer clear? Yeah, and, and something that, uh, first of all, Dr. Ford, thank you so much, and thank you to to all of all of those that are involved with Promise Scholars. And I don't want to interrupt your presentation too much. I, I think you're kind of near the end, but something mm -hmm. that I want to really emphasize to the board and really to the public that's tuned in, we we think we found a model here that works. We actually know we found a model that works because it's it 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 works for CUNY, and and it it's worked across thousands of students for that system. You can see the preliminary results are are um, are positive, and uh, if 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 trends hold, we're going to really significantly increase our completion rates. It, it, the data show it. So we feel we have the model. What we don't have, and you can see this, is the funding. And this is long term. This is something as chancellor, I'd like to work with the board on: is how do we do it? How do we how do we secure the funding? And what I'm most concerned about is and we've gotten some legal opinions and we may need to get a few more, but as we understand it, we are really not allowed to use unrestricted dollars for direct student support other than some narrow areas such as food and, and other places. So, you know, you, you see how we've aligned the, the direct support resources to students and th those dollars help, um, but, you know, I don't wanna give, uh, you know, Tom Bauer a heart attack or, or Takiya Warden a heart attack, but you know, I'm, I'm expecting enterprise funds. I'd like to quadruple the support from enterprise funds for this because it gives us the flexibility to put money right into students' hands. We need to continue to work with the foundation. Um, other than that, if we really want to scale this up to the 5,000 student need we have, we're going to have to really strategize and figure out a funding source. And I doubt 
um, if it's going to be able to come from unrestricted dollars, first of all, because we don't have that amount to, to spend necessarily. And secondly, uh, it, it, our preliminary legal analysis tells us we can't use those funds to waive dollars. So I just wanted to kind of pause there and point that out to the board. We've got the model. We don't have the funding. And this is where I would love to work with the board uh, to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Claire, so much. I appreciate that the level of commitment um, and collaboration to really see this program um, come to full fruition, right? To do the maximum amount of good possible. Okay. All righty. So that was kind of my take on it, but I think what everyone would really love to hear or who to hear from are our actual Promise Scholars. Um, and so we've invited with us today some students that are in the program. We even have an alum of the program, as well as some of our team members to just share a little bit about their experience with the program uh, and the impact that they've seen it have either on themselves as a student or uh, for our counseling faculty, kind of how they've seen the program be impactful for the students that they work with. And so I'm going to stop my screen and invite uh, Michael Jesu from Skyline College. He is a fall 2019 cohort member. Um, Michael, if you want to unmute yourself and just share a little bit about your experience in the program. Good evening, members of the board and college administration. Um, as a Promise Scholar, I have really benefited mostly from the counseling support that is being provided to me by the Promise Scholars program. From the start, I was assigned a counselor, which I had originally thought I was not going to use because in the past, I've had bad experiences with counselors. I expected the first meeting to be like other meetings I had where counselors asked about my classes, asked if I needed anything and sent me on my way, but this was different. I was able to get to know my counselor and who they are as a person, and I was able to share who I am and my goals. The first time we met, we barely talked about classes, which I really enjoyed because now I was not meeting a stranger, I was meeting a mentor. This made me feel more comfortable to ask for help and advice on my education and future career goals. Throughout our meetings, my counselor helped me with more than just picking our classes. She reminded me of important deadlines such as registration and scholarship deadline. She informed me about amazing programs in which she helped me get into, which were Berkeley Virtual Experience and Starting Point. She also kept me informed about the many different scholarships and I was lucky enough to have won one. My counselor was able to help me with my transfer application process and help me with TAG, which has been extremely helpful. My counselor was also able to inform me about all these many different opportunities that I would have never known about if it wasn't for her and all everything she offered. Um, Growing up and even in high school, I always wanted to go to a UC, but it always felt out of reach because of how expensive it would be. When I shared this with my counselor, she informed me about the many different ways I would be able to pay for it and told me not to let the cost of something hold me back from doing it. And thanks to the Promise program this fall, I'll be applying to transfer not only to state colleges, but also UCs. And this program has helped me with more than just counseling. It helped me financially and in many more ways. I do not think I would be on track to transfer out of community college in two years if I was not in a Promise Scholar program. This enabled me to be a full-time student and work part-time instead of the other way around. Um, thank you for giving me your time to share my experience of being in the Promise Scholar program and have a great rest of the evening. Very good. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. We really appreciate you taking the time to share your experiences and your thoughts and so glad that you're part of the Promise Scholars program. So now I'd like to introduce uh, Jesus Robles from Kenyatta College, a member of the fall 2018 cohort. <clears throat> Good evening, members of the board and college administrators. My name is Jesus Robles, but I go by JJ. I'm a computer science major at Kenyatta College, and I've been a Promise Scholar since fall 2018, as, just, as you guys just heard. As a Promise Scholar, I have really benefited from the counseling support and financial support. Counseling support was very helpful as it helped me decide what major was right for me. Coming into my first year of college, I was an animation major, but switched to computer science right before the semester started. Throughout the year, I was very unsure if I was in the right major. 
I frequently met with my promise counselor, Jeanette, and we went over both majors thoroughly and ultimately found that computer science was the best fit for me. And since then, I have not questioned my decision. In addition to counseling support, the financial support the Promise program offered was very instrumental to my academic success. During my first year of college, I had to quit my job at a car dealership because they did not, uh, they were not very accommodating to my schedule. The Promise financial support allowed me to focus on school because it assured me that my tuition and fees would be covered. Not only did they pay for my classes, but they offered monthly incentives such as gas and food vouchers. Most recently, due to the switch to remote learning, the Promise College program has offered online gift cards as incentives, which has helped me and my family in buying groceries and other household essentials. In addition, I had the opportunity to serve as a Promise student ambassador since fall 2019. As a student ambassador, I was able to help high school, high school outreach events to help our other first generation students like myself. Um, I help students recognize the benefits and resources the Promise Scholars Program has to offer. I also had the chance to connect with current scholars and build lasting friendships in the program. The Promise Scholar has really helped me to be successful in college because of the guidance and support that I received through them. I'm currently on track to graduate this spring semester and with the support of the Promise Program, I will apply to transfer for fall 2021 admissions as a computer science major. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my experience on how the Promise Scholars Program has benefited my academic journey. Have a great evening. Thank you so much, JJ, for sharing. We appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your evening to share as well. Um, and glad that you were able to meet with Jeanette and kind of solidify that computer science. And we're just excited to see what you do next. Okay, so we have next Cameron Coom from College of San Mateo, also a member of the fall 2019 cohort. Cameron. Good evening, members of the board and college administrators. Um, I, have overall, I have overall enjoyed the whole Promise Scholar experience. The parts that have helped me gain confidence as a student would particular, particularly be um, by utilizing the counseling academic support. With the counseling, I've been able to consistently make sure I'm on track with my transfer plan. And also, I felt like my counselor has also been a life coach to me because she's been really helpful and motivating me and, you know, encouraging me, especially right now, to put my best effort that I can. And with academic support, by having the opportunity to be part of a certain prom, to be part of certain promise courses has let me meet the most supportive students and has helped my overall character grow. Even now, as the college has transitioned to being online, I felt very supported through the Promise staff and the feeling of being part of a strong and motivated community. Overall, I have loved the Promise Scholar experience and I felt extremely grateful for the support they've given me to best prepare my transfer journey. I hope the future students will be able to experience the same love and support that I've received from this program. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my experiences and have a great evening. Thank you so much, Cameron. That was awesome. We're glad that you feel welcomed and supported and affirmed within the Promise Scholars family. Super happy to have you. Okay, so next we have um, Lexi and Zoe Dukakis. So they're sisters that are both Promise Scholars. Um, one is a current Promise Scholar, that is Zoe, part of the fall 2019 cohort. And then Lexi is actually a Promise alum. And so we'll uh, hear from Zoe first, uh, just to share a little bit about your experience. And then Lexi, if you could share afterwards, that would be great. All right. Good evening, members of the board and college administrators. I am Lexi Dukakis. And I am Zoe Dukakis. And I am a first time college student at College of San Mateo and member of the Promise program. Um, going into my first semester of college, I didn't really know what to expect, especially since we were on a virtual online platform, but having a team behind me like the Promise program has enabled my transition from high school to college to be a seamless one and helped me navigate um, exactly where I'm supposed to, or what's expected of me as a college student. Um, they have given me a sense of community, especially through um, online workshops, such as community building workshops and mental health and wellness workshops, connecting me to a counselor um, who has been a tremendous help, my counselor, Sunny Martin. Um, she has helped me with career identity and figuring out my major, um, directing me of what types of classes I need to take in order to complete 
my associates and transfer to a four-year university. Not only have they helped me in this aspect, but they have also helped me financially. So they have financially supported me so I can get um, free textbooks and take classes I am passionate about. They have afforded me to get a laptop so I can take all these online classes as well as supported my full-time student education and enrollment. Yeah, I really think that the Promise program has benefited us in many ways. Um, our parents, when we want told them that we're going to go and pursue college, they're freaking out like how even though we are two years apart, like how they're going to be able to afford both of us going to college and obtaining bachelor's degree. And with me being a first generation student, I was kind of like the test trial for my family to jump into the deep end and see what happens. And um, the Promise program really enabled me to um, have like a smooth and, and seamless transition from high school into community college and really figure out my path and where I wanted to go and, and um, what I was going to do with my career. And so, and not only like it, thankfully uh, we, we're so grateful that they're able to pay for all of our classes and our books and even give us like the, the vouchers. Like I know when I was in, um, when I was at CSM College of San Mateo during, well, I first enrolled in fall of 2018 and I graduated in May 2020 and I earned an associate's degree. They were able to give me vouchers for um, gas money so I couldn't be able to afford gas to drive to school. Um, but really what we, what I mainly benefited from was the counseling. I also had Sunny Martin and she really um, was a lot more, she was a lot more genuine and, and considerate and really wanted to help me grow and, and get through the program and succeed in it. So um, I liked all how she and all the other counselors at CSM were able to, to help us navigate through our major and make sure that we like graduated successfully. And so now I am a transferred, um, this is my first semester at San Francisco State University. I graduated from College of San Mateo with an associate's degree in film, television, and electronic media. And now I'm in a majoring to get my bachelor's degree in cinema. And so I think the Promise program really helped me through like their workshops and transferring and being able to talk to other students and how they're transferring um, to a four year college. And so I felt a, le a lot less um, worried about going to a four year college. And I felt like the Promise program really prepared me. And yeah, and I kind of missed that counseling that I had when I was at College of San Mateo, that one on one counseling. So yeah, I really liked it, enjoyed it. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That was great. Yeah. Thank you both for sharing your story. Uh, welcome, Zoe, to college. Uh, no one knew college is going to be in little boxes like this, um, but we're glad that you feel welcome and supported for your promise, folks. And congrats to you, Lexi, uh, for being able to transfer and to continue your studies at SSA. It's a great school for cinema. So uh, congratulations to you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of our student speakers for being able just to share a little bit more about your experience. It really does kind of make the program real when we get to hear from you all and just about the impact of the program, the opportunities that it's been able to provide for you, but really the support and that sense of support that you've been able to receive um, as participants within the program. So thank you so much for, for taking the time on a Wednesday evening. I'm sure you have homework, <laughs> but to to be able to just share with us, we really, really do appreciate it and are just so very proud of all of you and all of the great things that you all are doing. We also have with us a few of our Promise team members. And so um, I'd like to start uh, by introducing Leo Cruz. He's a counselor at um, the College of San Mateo. Just to talk a little bit about what it's like on the other side. What's it like to be a counselor within Promise and the impact that we've been able to see um, from the counselor's perspective? Leo? All right, thank you, Dr. Ford. Um, so yeah, I just wanna say good evening. Um, thank you everyone for having me here. Thank you so much for the students. Um, I really appreciate your honest perspective on your experiences with the program. Um, so yeah, um, as Dr. Ford mentioned, I am a counselor at College of San Mateo and I've been with Promise since fall of 2018. So since it was year one Promise, um, there's been a lot of growth. It's a very, it just moved very, very quickly, but I'm very happy to be a part of the program I think one of the things that I wanted to highlight today is just the importance of the counseling 
that goes on. As a lot of the students already spoke to, um, I feel that one of the biggest crucial um, parts of this program is the counseling um, ratio that we have, the um, caseload, 150 students per counselor. I think that's very, very important because, and I really appreciate Michael mentioned, um, you know, when he first came to counseling, he thought, oh, you know, they're just gonna tell me what classes to take, I'm on my way. Um, it really, that, that, that isn't my experience. Um, when I feel like when all of us promise counselors to work with students, the first session, we don't even talk about classes. I wanna know about the student. Where are you coming from? Where are you going? What is your plan? I want to know about you because you're an individual and you have your career goals, your academic goals, your personal life. It's completely different from the student that I'll be seeing, you know, before and after. So I think that's super crucial, the approach that we take as counselors. Um, a lot of the students that I meet with, I ask them, you know, what are your goals and what is your timeline? And the most common response that I get is a two-year track. I wanna transfer, I wanna be here two years. Students don't wanna be here three years. Students don't wanna be here six years. Um, so I think it's very important, you know, the financial aspect that Promise provides students because as Michael also mentioned, instead of him being a full-time um, worker and a part-time student, it was able to be the reverse, you know, part-time worker and full-time student. Um, and as one of the indices that was mentioned earlier, being a full-time student really does lead to better outcomes in terms of degree attainment and retention and all of those things. Um, another thing that I just wanted to talk about is I think that through counseling, you know, I could talk about this all day, but it's very complex, the community college system and transfer and all these um, particulars, sometimes even with AP or IB, there's limitations, um, dual enrollment. So I think being able to meet with students once a month throughout the t first day that they step on campus, even before, because we do orientations, up until they graduate is super, super helpful because I get to catch so many things, um, you know, course substitutions, AP limitations, how, how will that AP, you know, is for UC Santa Cruz, is there, do you need a four or higher, and, you know, it, it, for the AP score, it can get super, super complex really, really fast. There's a lot of, um, just different complexities, but at the end of the day, that's my job. The student's job is just to show up, put in the work that they, the hard work that they do. Um, but yeah, through the relationship and through that um, student counselor dynamic, it's just, it, it's able to lead to success as we've seen in the data that has been, that has been presented. Um, so, you know, that's just a little bit of what I wanted to share. I think I've also um, enjoyed the partnerships that some of you have mentioned earlier um, I taught a fall 2019 was the first time I taught a counseling course, an academic success course at Hillsdale. And now I have some of those promised students, some of those students that I had in my class are now promised students um, in fall 2020 um, cohort. So it's really nice, you know, being that go-to person and students, um, especially when we transitioned from in-person to um, online, I, had, I was inundated with emails and so many students reached out to me, but I was happy. I was like, oh my gosh, thank goodness that students know that I'm their go-to person and that I can provide resources, uh, some of which are very vital and information because if I was confused, I could only imagine that students were very, very confused. Um, so yeah, I just wanna say, I really, really appreciate um, all of the hard work from so many of the people virtually who are here today. And I appreciate the continued support of the program. And yeah, thank you so much for your time. Very good, thank you. And thank you, Leo, so much for all that you do, being that go-to person for our students. I know that they, they so very much appreciate it, as we heard from the students uh, before about just that importance of being able to meet with their counselor and build that relationship. And so we have one more counselor to share some insights. Um, and so I'd like to introduce Jeanette Linares from Kenyatta College, just to share a little bit more about her experience as a counselor within Promise. Jeanette? Thank you, Lauren. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Jeanette Linares, and I have had the honor of being one of the Promise counselors for the past year and a half. I have also had the pleasure of teaching one of the first cohort courses for Promise Scholars at Kenyatta College, Career 137, this semester. And uh, this past year, but truly this past semester, has allowed me to witness how crucial it is for students to be part of a learning community. 
As we all know, the transition to online was not easy for students, but nonetheless, our Promise team made sure that the process was as smooth as possible. We were all ready to put in the work to ensure that we retain students while making it clear that we were fighting or figuring out this new normal together. Um, and really this meant adjusting our hours so we could provide counseling support all week, um, ensuring that different support staff and services were available beyond what was previously normal and simply being able to create a virtual space so students felt supported and still felt part of that learning community. Um, I believe this is possible because the replication of the CUNY ASAP model allows us to dismantle inequitable structures in place. Um, just like my colleague Leo explained, we know our students, right? So we're able to meet and address those individualized needs. And through this, we're really able to create cultural relevant programming um, to not only create cultural relevant programming for students, but we are always actively gathering data through surveys and retention efforts to continue to find new ways to create avenues of support. Through our programs, students are able to build rapport with staff, have that designated counseling, and continue building community not only with us, but with their peers. So we are here for today for that exact reason, to let you know that this is working and that through this model, students are able to achieve their educational goal. And you can look at the data too as a proof of that. I'm lucky enough to be both an instructor and a counselor for many first time college students and fortunate enough to be in a position where I'm able to maintain that student engagement, that student retention, and the most important part is that I'm able to guide students through the process by providing that individualized support the minute they commit to promise. So now more than ever, we need to ensure that our students are able to feel supported. So I invite you all to come, like Lauren said, and engage with our students so you are able to see that uh, firsthand the difference this program is making in each of their lives. Thank you all. Thank you, Jeanette. That's really good. Yes, thank you so much, Jeanette. We really appreciate um, you just sharing um, just about the incredible work that you all are doing to really create that space and the importance of, of being able to create that sense of community um, while also being true to, you know, investigating what, are, what is the data? Who are our students? What are we missing? Um, and constantly kind of asking yourselves those questions in order to be a stronger program. And so, Thank you so very much for taking the time um, to share and your experience and in, in the highlighting the amazing work that you all are, are doing, um, not only at Kenyatta, but at CSM, at Skyline College, the, the counselors, the program staff, the administrators that support this program um, are really doing an incredible job. Um, and we're able to see that uh, both in the data as we reflect uh, about the outcomes of the students, but also as we hear the students' stories. Um, and just hear how comforting, how welcoming, how affirming, and how on track they are, right? That's, that's the big one. Uh, they're on track. They're here to achieve their goal, to do a thing, and they are doing the thing. And so we're just so happy um, about the progress of the, the program thus far and our replication of the ASAP model. Um, and I'm happy to have been able to share this, this update with you all here tonight. Okay, Lauren, thank you. I guess back to Dr. Levine. Uh, thank you, President Schwartz. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Ford, for, for that, that, that presentation on the Promise Scholars Program. And thank you to all of our Promise Scholars, all of our counselors, all of our Promise leads at the campuses who joined us this evening. Um, it is a completion program, as Dr. Ford said. And this is a study session on our strategic plan. And if we read through that, all the alignment of all of these efforts really is to get students to completion because we know what that means for their lives, for the lives of their family, and for the communities that they live in and that are part of San Mateo County. So um, I've been thinking a lot about how to end this one. Um, I think uh, in, in this time, what I see is, is this district represents a tremendous source of hope for the members of our community. And it's that hope that not only that we fulfill by giving them access to higher education, but by staying with them, engaging them through all of the efforts, not just what we described tonight, but all the efforts that we continue to share with the board that you continue to support because they know that by 
completing their educational goals, then that provides them a better life, a better life for their families, a better life for their communities. And so um, I'm uh, really uh, proud and, and I feel fortunate to be part of that hope for our communities. And I want to thank everyone um, in this, in this uh, Zoom space for being part of that as well. And with that, um, that concludes our, our study session presentation for the board on the District Strategic Plan and the Promise Scholars Program. So, President Schwartz, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McVean. Any uh, comments or questions from board members? Uh, Vice President Norris? Uh, thank you, Dr. McVean and everyone for uh, the presentation. I have to say it was nothing less than epic because so many people obviously prepared and came to our meeting and waited their turn. And I appreciate so much the fact that we had contribution and um, information from so many people that are doing so much good work in these areas. It's very gratifying to uh, hear that, um, you know, it's, it's alive and it's working and it's something that gives us a lot of hope that it will continue to grow and uh, provide um, uh, the type of um, momentum and um, uh, programming that our students need and uh, I, I'm just glad that our district is at the front end of this and that um, we are uh, being a good example to others as well and uh, doing uh, the kind of work that is necessary to serve our students. And so again, I thank you and uh, thank uh, all of our presenters tonight. Thank you. Somebody needs to mute. Okay, yeah, other board members? Sure. Leslie Oliver. Uh, well, first, uh, thank you to everyone for a great presentation and uh, particular thanks to our students. I'm happy to hear your uh, positive experiences and keep uh, persisting and keep succeeding in life. Um, and uh, to our counselors for, for your uh, participation as well in the presentation. Uh, it's a great program. We're, it seems like we're getting a preview of numbers, uh, more more numbers to come to measure the success, but that preview looks great. Uh, I do have a couple of questions on it. Um, we have counselors who are um, not part of the you know promise program for the rest of our students. Do we have two separate pools of counselors? I'm just curious how this works. The mechanics is a counselor either a dedicated Promise uh, Scholar, Counselor, or uh, rest of the academic uh, community counselor? How does that work? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll take that and, and others feel free. So we do have uh, counselors who are dedicated to the Promise Scholars program, but Promise Scholars also see other counselors that we have. So for example, um, we have Promise Scholars students who also um, uh, qualify for EOPS or for TRIO. And so their, their, their dedicated counselor might actually be an EOPS counselor, um, and, but their interactions with that counselor are part of their required meetings every month that they have as part of the Promise Scholars program. So we both have Promise Scholars counselors who are just seeing students in the Promise Scholars program, as well as other counselors and other dedicated programs who may have Promise Scholars as part of their specific caseload as well. And, and that those counseling sessions are credited uh, towards the requirement for the student to have a certain number of counts. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, and, uh, and, and that's been one of the that's been one of the big adaptations too, and it, it has taken a lot of work in order to um, understand all the different points of contact that a student, a promise scholar, might have, and to be able to make sure that that all of those groups are working together to integrate those experiences and that they count. So it was actually part of a, a lot of the work that had to be done at the colleges across all of these different programs that have specific counselors in them. Yeah. Great. You know, I had a couple of questions or comments, I guess, on the overall plan. Uh, so I don't know if other uh, trustees that want to perhaps go first just on the uh, Promise Scholar presentation before, before we get to the other overall uh, five-year plan or, you know, our strategic plan. Strategic plan. Uh, well, let's, we'll put it out there. Any other trustees want to talk about the scholar program? 
Promise Program, Trustee Mendelkin. I just want to make two comments. Uh, first, uh, Dr. McVean, thank you very much for your presentation and the progress we've made in the uh, strategic plan update as, as a member of the subcommittee and representing the board along with Trustee Nurris. I, I think you very accurately captured uh, the, the steps that we took during a number of meetings, both pre-COVID and then post-COVID when we've been able to start up again. So thank you for that. And then secondly, I just wanted to thank the students and Dr. Ford for your putting together the presentation on the Promise Scholars Program. I think we knew when we first saw this about five years ago that this was, was a very special program that had great potential for our district. And it's just really gratifying to see now uh, after you know, five years of hard work and effort by many people to hear from the students who have been participating in it and just kind of how well this is actually working out. So I'm really, really glad that we took the big plunge into doing this. And I hope we're able to continue pushing this forward to uh, you know, even greater success and completion for our students. Uh, and I think the initial numbers look good, but there's obviously still a lot of hard work left to be done and some fairly you know, weighty problems to wrestle with around some of the funding issues that Chancellor Claire brought up that we, that we still will need to deal with down the road. But you know, it was a great presentation and great update on where we stand. And as always, it's terrific to hear from our students who are benefiting so much from this program. Thank you. Thank you. Board members? Um, I just would like to say that um, I met Dr. Lauren Ford a few years ago when Skyline College had duplicated a program that had been done at Kenyatta, and I can't remember the exact title, but it was bringing kindergarten students from the area up to the Kenyatta. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that it came to back to me when I heard previous conversation about how, uh, I, I totally agree. I think going to the high schools is fabulous. You still need to go back further, further to try to capture students and get them goals to come on to college. And the kindergarten thing was really planting that seed. And boy, if you could ever put something like that back together, I think it would be beneficial for all the students in our area. Um, it's just a way of life, but uh, you know, just to throw that out there. Um, my question on the uh, Promise program was, uh, and I should know this, but on the funding, you said housing. So what, what is the housing source for the fund, that part of the funding? Dr. McBean, I guess, or? Well, um, yes. Uh, yeah, so so that, that was from our, our, our housing fund. Um, um, it, and. Bernardo might have better details, but revenue generated from uh, our faculty staff housing. So part of that housing fund, which is one of the sources of the flexible funds. That is, and Dr. Mervin, uh, you're correct. So uh, the revenue that's uh, uh, available from the uh, two housing um, uh, projects that we have, Canada Vista and College Vista, uh, the revenue uh, that's available um, uh, some of it is available uh, for um, the Promise program, and it's been um, we have been using a very few dollars for to to uh, provide it for our students. Yeah, which is, <clears throat> the question that runs in my, my mind is that money have to be repaid to the housing? Uh, it's because it's like not. It does not. It does not. Uh, it's not required to be repaid to the housing. Um, it's. Uh, those dollars um, are free to be used by the district um, as needed for any uh, projects or any um, causes that the district or the board uh, decides to use. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and my, well, my last plea would be, you know, I didn't put myself back on here or I touched something here. Um, my last plea would be, this is so successful, it's proved to be successful, it will probably grow. But I, and I think you touched on it, your part -time, our part-time students, if we, we need something for them also. Um, and I think with this pandemic, what has happened, our part-time students are really getting even less part-time because they just don't have the opportunity to take classes because of the situation. So I would hope to maybe hear someday that there's some kind of a program that's specifically for the, for the part-time students because they're, they are serious students. And it will unfortunately take them a little longer because of their other situations. But I just think I could editorial on my part. So, but thank you. Great presentation. Thank you, students, for coming. 
we'll do anything to get you here because it's always wonderful to hear from the actual people who are of, of, of right in the middle of right at the beginning of everything and to hear success stories is better than that so turning it back to board members uh let's see i guess it'd be Tr trustee holliver you want to go back and ask some questions about the strategic plan i uh, i just had a couple of comments um uh, first i'll just repeat um what i had said earlier when we look at the the data um you know we are i believe looking at um two distinct groups of um, students that we serve and um i'm focusing right now on our resident uh students so california residents uh that i i believe we should set these goals for resident uh, you know, completion rates, um, persistency rates. I mean, you can go, to, go down the list. Um, transfer rates, degree completion, uh, college transfer, et cetera, as a, uh, as a goal of uh, uh, distinct from, we may want to set a goal for um, uh, non-resident students, but I would like to see the, those goals be addressed um, so that there's no, um, you know, merging uh, of numbers that could inflate our success rates because we do have a cohort, primarily the international students, that have a really different profile, uh, different financial means, different um, uh, family and academic goals. So I would like to be able to see that. And I think the way you see it is by developing goals that uh, are defined by resident um, completion, success, transfer, and so forth. Um, the only other comment I have is I'm trying to scroll through it, um, and that's goal four. And um, I think it's been improved. In well, from my standpoint, um, I'm. I'm happier with the way it's being presented. Um, this is really about our financial uh, strength. Um, I would say first and foremost, our number one focus should be on preserving our basic aid status. Um, so far, so good. You know, we've not yet been on the radar screen with um, the state, uh, whether the legislature, the governor or others. Um, that may change each year. And certainly that is the key to our financial strength. So um, while I agree with the advocacy, uh, I think maybe there should be more done in that area. I mean, I've suggested it a couple of times going back a few years. I really believe that just like in the K-12 um, system, the basic aid districts form their own, in effect, lobbying entity. Um, because uh, they have some distinct needs that are different than the other thousand somewhat um, K-12 school districts, that we should do that with our uh, fellow, um, you know, basic aid community college districts, like actually establish our own lobbying operation and fund it distinct from community college league and so forth. Uh, the, the, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Actually, we are part of a coalition and, and there is discussion around that lobbying so um i can i can update you on that but we are okay. we, we're actually our regular participants in those discussions so just to let okay. you know good good so that's uh moving in in that direction um you know i guess i've observed over lots of years being in and out of the capital not on college issues but other issues uh you got to have a presence it's got to be distinct um it's got to be vocal uh so i think that's really the direction it needs to go uh, the other one, and, you know, I think this gets things more back in proportion than I think was the case previously. Um, certainly, we want to increase our community continuing and corporate education uh, programs. Um, I have commented from time to time that in doing that, uh, it's essential that we keep in our um, evaluation that those are programs that are not in any way competing with for credit education, um, not in any way creating 
certificate programs that do not um, really provide the same kind of job entry um, uh, portal that the recognized four credit certificate programs provide and that there's no encroachment uh, by these continuing education programs on our core academic uh, programs. So that would be something I would like to see incorporated into the statement. Um, it's always a tension. You know, we know that when folks are motivated and they are, there's no question that that program is motivated to grow and build and innovate and, and they do a great job at that. But we have to also make sure we have a boundary that is not in any way moving people who would benefit from actual four credit coursework being taught by accredited uh, faculty members that qualifies them for transfer and for for you know degree programs and certificate programs that are recognized in the outer world and workforce um, from encroaching on that. So that's my suggestion that more language could be added in that area. Great. Thanks, Trustee Halliburton. We'll make sure to incorporate um, your, your thoughts um, as we go through this revision over the next uh, couple of months. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So anything else you want to sum up with, Dr. McQueen? Uh, no, just thank you, uh, as always, for the, for the board for, for, for inviting the study session every October. Um, it's always one of my favorites of the year to give this update. So look forward to doing it again next year. Um, and thank you, everyone who attended and, and, and presented tonight. Um, just really great work in support of our students. Very good. Again, thank you. And thank you to all the presenters. Uh, very good information and all the people behind the scenes that went to putting your uh, presentation together. So a lot of hard work. So yeah, hope to see you before next year, but you never know. Okay. Information reports. 20-10-2C, a discussion of the statewide efforts to call attention to the digital divide. Um, Trustee Holliber brought this to my attention and I think it's worthwhile to discuss. So I will open it up for discussion and I will let Trustee Holliber open it up. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, President uh, Schwartz for putting it on the agenda. Uh, I just came across a couple of items uh, in my uh, Twitter feed. Uh, that uh, caught my eye. Uh, first was this letter that brought me to the um, uh, report that uh, is attached here from Cal Matters. And, um, you know, I, uh, if you look at the report, um, and it takes a little work, but um, there are links in it, and it goes uh, county by county, it goes through each level of higher ed, uh, goes county by county and it goes college by college. So I, and it's not the easiest thing to, uh, fi to figure out how to like link it and then open it to be big enough to be able to view it. But let me tell you what, what it says about our three colleges. Um, students that are uh, lacking uh, real internet access, okay? So if you take the reports on our three colleges and it breaks it down by each college, um, for low, what, what they describe as low income uh, students, uh, 436 of our students at our three colleges are lacking internet, broadband internet connections for distance education. Um, 468 are lacking the right device, computer or other device that they need for distance education. And then they also look at it in terms of students of color uh, across our three colleges. For uh, students of color, 1,208 are defined as lacking proper internet access. 1,114 uh, are lacking the kind of device needed for distance education. Now, I don't know if they just kind of took the entire state and sliced it proportionately, you know, or whether they went into some greater detail. It could be it's just, you know, looking at our characteristics and slicing it. And I know there are a lot of things we're doing uh, and those are great efforts, but uh, there's more we can do. So when I saw this letter, I, you know, and I 
read it and I saw that it is signed by uh, local San Mateo County school board members and, and city council members. And I thought, well, what are we chop liver? You know, let's, let's, let's be, let's, let's get on the next, uh, you know, the next uh, step of this. It's a call for the governor to, to, to convene a, a special session to uh, pass uh, universal broadband access legislation uh, with a focus, not exclusively on students, but with that as, as, as a big focus. And I just think it's something we ought to, you know, the Electronic Frontiers Foundation is uh, a driving force or perhaps the driving force that pulled this letter together. And um, uh, I know them well, I'm a little mad they didn't uh, ask me <laughs> to get involved because I work with them on a lot of stuff, but hey, it ain't too late. So I'll just leave it at that. I think we ought to be, you know, joining in these efforts. Okay, any comments from other board members? Uh, Trustee Mandelkern? Yeah, Trustee Holliver, I agree with you. I think, you know, we, we've recognized a need. We've taken some Band-Aid steps like making Wi-Fi available in our parking lots for students, but that's, uh, you know, a, a very patchwork solution and not a, not a permanent long-term solution. I'm also worried as, you know, in many aspects of our COVID response, not just at our college, but countywide, things that work well now while the weather is good and people can be outdoors and things like that are going to be more problematic as the weather takes a turn for the worse. And I'm not sure that students are gonna to wanna to be sitting in a car in the cold and the rain in January trying to access Wi-Fi, which is why you know I've been pushing hard and I hope we continue to push today. Can we reopen some of our buildings for students who may need a place where they can come in and sit down and have a quiet place where they can take a class or they can do their homework and their problem sets where they can get access to uh, wi not just Wi-Fi, but also access to the computers in our learning centers, which we know our students use heavily during normal times, which would tend to indicate that that's how some of those students who don't have devices are bridging that gap. And I think it's incumbent upon us to continue to, to work harder to try and make as many support services available to our students as possible in ways that are long-term sustainable for our students. Agreed. Um, any other comments? We seem to have lost Trustee Goodman. I don't know where he went, but we're trying to find out if he just got disconnected. Yeah, I, I just texted him. I know we have some planned power shut down, so I, maybe uh, that's it, but, but um, hopefully we'll We'll get them back in a bit. <laughs> you might be involved in that. Uh, when Trustee Holliver sent me that information, my reaction was, I mean, I've kind of heard distant discussion about having internet access for all throughout the state. And I think this is just an example of how, how it's needed. Um, if you get, if you talk to anybody K through 12, everybody's got the same situation with, with their kids and the families. And I agree. We've, opening up the parking lots, I said, I think it's fabulous. If you can get there, if you have a car, um, you don't always have that access to get them there. So I kind of look at you, Trustee Holliver, what do you think our next step could be to get involved in this? You're mu muted. You're muted. <laughs> right. Well, uh, you know, I th I'd say the immediate step would be um, to uh, work with this letterhead and you know it's what, what we call a, a nascar letter where you got all the logos like on a racing car of all the different organizations uh we we do these letters all the time uh, uh you know I, I work for a consumer group we're lobbying in sacramento um and you know we you put together all these different logos and signatures and um i would probably start with the eff uh and say you know we we want to join in this effort to um, try to persuade our governor to convene a special session. Because this is a big global societal problem. And yeah, I applaud what we're doing to try to address it uh, as best we can locally. We, we, we have to, uh, but we won't solve it locally. This requires a kind of investment that California has made. You know, you think about other infrastructure investments that the state has made. Uh, this is this is basic infrastructure investment for people to survive, and we should be promoting it and pushing it. So I would start there and participate and see where it goes. Right. Uh, if uh, 
Trustee Mendelkern and Trustee Norris agree. Um, you have my support to do whatever is ne necessary to, to get us a, more information or more involved. Um, maybe we, we need the service of staff from Vice mm -hmm. Chancellor yep. Bailey and, and of course our Chancellor. Um, no, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I thank you, uh, Trustee Holliber, for bringing this to our attention and for uh, you know putting this on our agenda, sharing this information with all of us and hopefully through us to the other educational communities um, around us. Uh, some leadership on this uh, uh, at our end uh, is uh, obviously um, something that will help promote it. And uh, I, I completely agree that we should do whatever we can to uh, move in this direction. It occurs to me, if I may also, um, you know, why don't we reach out to the Community College League and, and urge them as a statewide organization to join in this call. But in the meantime, I, I, if, if I get a sense of, there's a consensus that we can endorse this concept of calling a special session for uh, universal broadband access legislation. Is that yeah. the consensus? I think, yeah, you have the consensus, yeah. I think I have heard no negativity about it at all. I think it's only positive. So, you know, we have the Bay 10. We, I mean, we can branch out from, from, from ourselves to the Bay 10 to the entire, I think the entire league would be very, very good strategy. Um, so, so whatever it takes. Chancellor. So President Schwartz, uh, uh, so Trustee, I guess through President Schwartz, Trustee Holliber, would you like us to work with you on, uh, 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 you know, a response here that uh, kind of reflects yeah. the wishes of the board? Okay, we'll, we'll go Happy ahead and reach out. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Thanks. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Thank you. Okay, we are down to communications. I don't have anything. Does any board members have anything they need to communicate with? Hearing none. Uh, statements from board members. Is our student trustee, Jade, are you still with us? There she is. Do you have anything you'd like to say tonight, Jade? Um, so, okay. two weeks ago, I met with um, the student councils for our first district student council meeting. It went really well. We were able to talk about what the different student leaders were doing on their campus and Something we're gonna talk about at our next meeting is how all three campuses can come together to try to find ways to connect with our students, possibly a town hall or a virtual event. Oh, very good. Very good. Congratulations. Other board members? Nothing from Trustee Mendelhorn, Trustee Holliber, Trustee Norris. Okay, I think we'll move, we'll move on to uh, uh, we haven't heard from Trustee Goodman, so I, I have a feeling your suspicion is probably correct. Then maybe North County. I'm South County. North Maybe North County got hit with the blackout. I don't know. Okay. Uh, so, uh, rem reminding everybody that we want to adjourn in the memory of Dr. I can't read my writing. Is it Jean Rhodes? Gina Rhodes? Gina. Gina, thank you. Gina Rhodes. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. We will adjourn in her memory. Um, there's no other statements from board members. We will go back to closed session, but the next board meeting here will be by Zoom on October 28th. So you have to, board members, you have to go back to our number from uh, Chancellor Claire earlier in the day. Thank you all for coming. Keep well, keep safe, keep your sanity. Keep a sense of humor, and we'll see you again soon. Stay safe. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Good night. Good night, all.